cities are humankind's most enduring and stable mode of social organization, outlasting empires and nations. Today, cities are the world's dominant demographic and economic clusters. During the first lockdown due to COVID-19, I got to see firsthand how robust and resilient my city, Vienna, Austria is, and it showed me how reliant, almost stubborn it is on how we use space. But it also showed me how flexible the city can be. Cities are at the center of innovation and change. They harbor an inherent duality of stability and flexibility, of endurance and change. I usually get to wear two hats. I'm a trained spatial planner, but I'm also a youth worker. So I know a thing or two about dualities. As a spatial planner, I've spent many years studying the city, the history, the issues, the opportunities, the plans and the people. And as a youth worker, I got to participate in actively claiming space, educating and experimenting. Balancing dualities can take different forms. On a personal level, you might do it like me and create a podcast, joining your knowledge of cities with educating and experimenting. But how can a city do that? How can we reimagine and remake the stuff around us? Thinking of the future of the city brings most people to ideas of flying cars, huge skyscrapers and blue skies. And on the other end of the spectrum, you get those who imagine a dystopia, full of pollution and concrete. But how should the future of the city really look like? And what do these utopian or dystopian ideas stand in for? I think if there is one thing all of us learned throughout the pandemic, it is that we are good at reimagining. On a small scale, we used space at home as our schools and offices. We met online rather than to fly across continents and we saw our cities in a new way. It also showed who is most affected when the system as we know it breaks down. Those at the margins, the poor and the vulnerable. So how can we imagine cities that are built to last, but resilient and don't leave anyone behind? Planning the city of the future with the frameworks of the past will not work. Most decisions in planning are guided by political decisions or legal frameworks. However, our current frameworks were not made with balance in mind. One example is the sealing of the ground. Putting asphalt or concrete means the soil underneath can no longer absorb water or produce food. In turn, this means that ecosystems are influenced. Water runoff is faster, leading to more severe flooding and depending on the terrain, mudslides. And food security can be heavily impacted as well. The surrounding area of Vienna has the most fertile land in all of Austria. To be able to have food security for our city, we need this land. However, currently, there is no legal framework for protecting high quality agricultural land from being turned into family homes. One of the most common protections currently comes in the form of habitat preservation, like in national parks and other similar protected areas. However, when planning for a sustainable future, we need to use and further develop holistic tools and methods for measuring the potential impact of projects. This means anticipating and internalizing not just economic costs, but social and environmental costs as well as expanding how we measure. Climate change brings heat and extreme weather phenomena. Another factor in building the city of the future is adaptable architecture, which can deal with these conditions but can also mitigate influences through appropriate building materials and their design. For example, by creating shaded public spaces or including space for water retention pools 
wind barriers, etc. This also means putting the needs of the people and the environment first. This summer, one of our biggest and busiest intersections in Vienna was blocked and a public pool was installed, temporarily, for all those who don't have the luxury to have their own backyard or pool. And this example brings me right to another aspect, land reclamation. Usually we hear the term related to claiming land, which used to be part of the sea. But in this case, I mean reclaiming space whether it is built up areas as space for redevelopment rather than to destroy further habitat or reclaim land for nature, renaturalizing everything from industrial zones to riverbeds. This also means to reclaim public space for the public as parks, recreational areas, as spaces without the obligation to consume or for public transportation. It seems that especially those already living in precarious conditions are often most affected by climate-related hazards, even though they emit the least amount. Currently, political efforts usually prioritize economic opportunities over sustainably balanced ones. So a further aspect for a livable city of the future is to reprioritize living conditions over economic output. Architecture and urbanization can play an essential role in creating a livable environment, which can also support a variety of livelihood strategies. These effects can be created through different inputs, like efficient grids, affordable housing, zoning and mobility. Especially public transportation has a big effect both in terms of ecological impact compared to individual motorization and in terms of economic empowerment of communities. And speaking of local, local materials can be another factor mitigating costs, especially environmental costs. In addition to shorter transportation, it also can help with creating adequate architecture for the local climate conditions especially through adapting vernacular building methods, which additionally supports cultural heritage and innovation. And lastly, greening. Greening means planting trees, shrubs or other vegetation in spaces that previously or traditionally don't have planned vegetation. I'm not talking about spontaneous growths between floor tiles, but planned vegetation in any form green rails, rooftops, courtyards, and even urban gardening or farming initiatives. If they are implemented on spaces that were previously not assigned green spaces, the advantages of greening include reduction of CO2, more perspiration surfaces, which create cooler microclimates and depending on the design might add more permeable surfaces, help filter water, reduce erosion and desertification. A secondary effect is achieved as habitat for species, both flora and fauna, whether that is tomatoes, bees or humans. The legal and political framework adapted an adaptable architecture. Land reclamation, reprioritizing living conditions over economic output, local materials, or greening are just a start when it comes to the future of the city. And localized solutions are the key to start pushing for climate justice. They are very visible and can give great input, but we can't just have sustainable flagship projects or special cases. It needs to be the norm and the usual. We need to rethink the stuff around us. See urban planning as part of a system, its interconnection with capital and the responsibility of the few who really have an opportunity to make choices and the many who don't dare to question the status quo or hold them accountable. The built environment is immobile and so we need to be extra vigilant about making long-term sustainable choices in design, construction and their interplay. It also means 
that we can't be fine concealing the worst, but demand real long-term solutions that move us forward in turning things around. Cities are a place of change and innovation, and cities are humankind's most enduring and stable mode of social organization, outlasting empires and nations. Let's use that to our advantage.